Actung, Actung. Welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk USA with me, Al Murray, James Holland, and John McManus. Um, hello, gents. How are we? Yep, all good. All good. How are you, Doing John? Great, what have you been up to? Doing great. Great to be with you. I've been giving midterms. I gave a midterm in my Vietnam class last week. Ah, right. Well, I'm keen to be a bit of a student to you um, for the next five minutes um, <laughs> because I'm I'm just trying to work out all the I think what people don't understand is is people don't understand how shipping works in the 1940s. They just don't don't get it. Don't understand the complexities of it, the numbers of the you know where where they're being produced, the demands on it, and you know when you look at something like Operation Avalanche and the in you know Fifth Army's assault of of, of Sicily, you can, I'm not Sicily of, of Italy around Salerno, you're gonna think well. God, if only they had two more divisions, you know, that would have made all the difference. And of course, they do have two more divisions. What they don't have is the shipping. But why is that? Why is it? And why isn't that you can't just sort of halt everything and send lots of supplies over to Bengal, for example? Right. I mean, it's it's a global war in which everything is dependent upon shipping. Every paperclip, every bullet, every soldier, every tank is dependent upon shipping. And you have demands on shipping, uh, you know, from the Indian Ocean to the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic to the Mediterranean. And so especially earlier in the war, tough choices have to be made at high levels as to what's going to have priority, what is possible, what isn't possible. And this is even true late in the war, too. I mean, um, you know, the capability by the Battle of Okinawa is, of course, tremendous. Uh, but still, you know, you're going to have four divisions go ashore at Okinawa when maybe you would have wanted six. Like you, know, like you said with Salerno, you'd love to yep. have two more divisions, but that's what's possible. Um, right. So, I mean, I think it's amazing the Allies did as well as they did, considering the U-boat threat, um, not just in the in the Atlantic, but in other seas as well. Sure, uh, yeah, yeah. The Gulf of Mexico and, and the Indian Ocean and whatever. I think it's amazing they did as well as they did, uh, as early as they did. You're losing what, like? A million and a half, two million tons of shipping in 1942 alone. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's unreal. Number. It's a huge amount, isn't it? But I mean, if you're kind of, you know, say, say you've got a a, a, a tanker full of of oil or, or or a Liberty ship full of trucks and tanks and bits of everything, how far ahead are you planning that? It depends on where you're going and what you're planning. Uh, but I, I would say probably a good three months ahead of time typically, uh, is what you're looking at. Before now. sailing and, and time. Before sailing time. And a lot can happen between now and then in terms of new shipping losses and, and uh, new problems with shipping lanes and and also the, the, the loading and unloading thing, which is a really unglamorous side of the war, but is tremendously important, is how you load things aboard these ships as intelligently as possible and then unload them once you get there. One, you know, like... In the South Pacific, at one point in the New Guinea campaign, uh, MacArthur's headquarters is running up to the main problem of not having enough resources to unload the ships that are coming in from the U.S. So think about that. You've moved heaven and earth in the U.S. to get ships to leave San Francisco or wherever. You've gotten them to New Guinea, and then they sit in harbor for 30 days because there aren't uh, uh, the crews and and, uh, the port facilities and whatever to absorb all the stuff you're unloading. Um, you know, that's kind of a morale buster too. So think of all the coordination there and then having to do this over some level of a secure communications network too, which is no sure thing either. It's, it's yeah, kind of yeah, staggering. Yeah. But that means that, that um, also what you've got to do is keep a handle on, you know, what, what a division requires in terms of its allocation. And that, that runs all the way back to manufacturing orders, doesn't it? So it does. However, however many Jeep, Jeeps you need, you know, once the army's decided what constitutes, you know, an infantry division or an, or an armoured division, that's essentially then turned into a procurement, you know, into factory orders, isn't it? I mean, it's that trail back, the coordination required to do that and to ship it and get it in the right place. You know, you can't be behind on your orders. Uh, a factory can't get behind because it's got to be shipped because it's, I mean, this. The pressure. And also, you're not firing. You're not firing shells uh, uh, consistently, are you? It's not like every day you're you're firing thirty. I know. It is mind boggling. It, it really, really is. is absolutely mind boggling. So, so for those who don't know, there's American official histories of the U.S. Army in World War II, and these are the kind of the green books. 
these green spine books, actually overseen by Pinky Ward, wasn't it? He was coming, right? Um, he, yeah. he, he was rather sort of shafted by um, by Friedendahl in 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 um, in Tunisia, but he but was. went on to do great things in organising the official histories. Um, and there's there's campaign histories, um, but there's also technical ones as well. And the book I've got I'm looking at now is the War Department: Global Logistics and Strategy, 1940 to 1943. Richard M. Layton and Robert W. Coakley. Now, generally, these books are quite hard work to get through. They're not exactly a light read, but they're 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 full of of stats. I mean, am I on the right tracks? Do you think? I mean, what else do I need to be looking at? Yeah, I mean, I think those are. Any other recommendations? And the successor volume are terrific books. What I would say that you could do even more is look at um, the process by which they put those books together. Sometimes that's mm-hmm. really interesting material. Uh, right. It's at the National Archives in College Park, and it's it's uh, it's a record group called Three Nineteen, which is mm-hmm. the history of the like the Center of Military History that that compiled these official histories. And what you'll find there a lot of times is really interesting correspondence, like. Uh, uh, from the commanders or whoever you know was going to be involved in whatever the volume is talking about, um, they had sent out the the army would have sent out you know this is probably five anywhere from four to eight years after the war kind of sent out all these um, correspondence and surveys to to say hey look at our manuscript tell us what you think and boy did they ever <laughs> 1955 yeah and boy yeah. did they ever I mean it, you know so. It, 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 I, you know, when I look at a lot of that stuff, it's, I think to myself, man, I can imagine being an historian trying to write those books when you've got all these generals and others pummeling you from every side saying, hey, that's wrong. That's wrong. What about us doing this and that? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, this yeah, historian yeah. doesn't have the first idea what he's talking about. And then you're caught between that and then Pinky Ward, who's heading up the center of military history. He's the chief of military history as a two star. So he's in the middle of this, too. And then he's trying to sort of pressure the historians but also let them do their thing it's quite a monumental effort and there's some really fascinating stuff there well they've also got some great maps and charts in this book logistics of british imperial defense 1940 to 1941 it's got this amazing map and it says suez to brisbane 7800 miles brisbane to london 13900 miles Goodness. singapore 11400 ceylon which is Sri Lanka now 10100 Suez, going all the way around South Africa, 12,100. So there's not God. much difference between Brisbane. God. I mean, mm. that's a sobering thought, isn't it? That's a long way, isn't it? Bloody hell. It is. Well, you know, the other thing about it too, okay, the strength is you have the secure base uh, bases. In other words, the United States is not under real assault or anything, and that's a secure industrial manufacturing base. It's a secure country. It's a secure food base and all this. And to some extent, Britain is to a point. In other words, it's not invaded, it's not overrun, it's bombed and harassed. But it is still a fairly secure industrial base or whatever. These are seafaring empires that have a great deal of, you know, muscle memory in this regard, especially Britain. So there's your strength. The weakness is all of the stuff has to be shipped to wherever you go because you want to fight on foreign battlefields, not your own soil. So if that's your war, it creates this new set of problems. And that really does boil down to shipping on a lot of levels. And who's making these allocation decisions? Who's deciding how much steel gets used for making tanks and how much is used for making ships? And how is that decision being made? Might. Well, a lot of that is is those decisions are made through the War Production Board, uh, which is the largest of all wartime agencies. Uh, But... Remember too, this is a this is Franklin Roosevelt and a New Deal administration, and they were very good at standing up agencies and all this kind of stuff. They'd done that during the Depression. Now they're going to do it during World War II. So a lot of times the agencies are working at cross purposes uh, with turf wars and and whatever else. But I, I tend to think the most important of all is the War Production Board under a guy named Donald Nelson. And see, he's yes. interesting. Because he had headed up Sears and Roebuck um, and had really it was a pathbreaker for a company that in its time was just the innovation company like Amazon now in a way. It's mail order, isn't it? Which was a big deal back then. It was home shopping, which is basically the same concept as Amazon, just a different kind of delivery method and, and obviously the electronic world 
of the internet and all that is completely different in that regard. But some of the concepts are the same. So Nelson heads up WPB because he has this great reputation. He also has a reputation for affability. He's good to work with. And that's true, but it also makes him vulnerable to the to the other uh, you know, turf warriors in Washington who are usurping his power and even some of his own aides. So if someone, if there is a kind of central brain making the decision, it tends to be WPB and the allocation of resources, like where the iron ore is going to go to make the steel and how much steel we're going to need for landing craft versus tanks versus, you know, ships. Or yeah, I mean, it, else. it kicks off with this extraordinary advisory board, doesn't it? Roosevelt invites all these people in, but you know, for the, these are the dollar a year men, you know, and and it is people like Edward R. Stettinus, the steel magnate. It's people like Bill Nudson, who's the who's the president of General Motors, uh, and these guys are drawn in, and it's a really clever idea because it's just an advisory board, so they're just mm-hmm. advisors. They're not in any official capacity. So if it all goes pear shaped, Roosevelt can distance himself from because they're just advisors. <laughs> but equally, it means that when he needs to discard them, he can discard them. And, and you know, Nudson famously gets discarded, doesn't he? He gets made the first ever zero to lieutenant general ever in the U.S. Army. <laughs> but that's at the time that the WPB get, get, gets inaugurated, doesn't it? it, it get created. And, and Don Nelson, who's been kind of in, in on that advisory board as well, gets elevated and takes over the show. But but it always amazes me that there's more there's more strike action in 1941 in the U.S. than just about any other year of that yeah. that century, um, which is extraordinary at the time where you know obviously they're having this massive transformation. Um, it's well, yeah. but there, there's the tension between the mobilization, the fact there isn't a war in 1941, isn't there? You've got that I suppose exactly. Yeah. You, you you're being marched up to the top of the hill, and what for? And um, and yeah. obviously, if you're a trade union, you think there's more work going on. Just as lend lease is a business opportunity for the US, to it's an opportunity for trade unions, isn't it? I mean, it's big time. I mean, we would assume oh, there's a war on, there's a higher purpose. Why would anyone strike? Well, there isn't a war on, and people disagree about the high purpose at this high purpose anyway. At this point, or, or are unconvinced of even of its existence. Right. Well, and the other things, the two things that are in the rearview mirror, sort of, are the Great Depression and yeah. the fact that FDR is presiding over what is probably the most pro-labor union administration in U.S. history. When he takes office in 1933, there were 3 million union members. By the time he dies, there's 14.8 million. Uh, wow. You know, I never <laughs> I mean, isn't that mind-blowing? Oh, jeep. Yeah, yeah so, so you're already seeing that by 1941, and uh, you know, it is an opportunity for the trade unions, but they think they've been skimped on through the whole depression, and that now they need to make up for that. Um, there's deep distrust, of course, with management and ownership and all this. And and FDR and his administration don't exactly have good relations with uh, the, the capitalist owners and all this as well. That's the other thing I think is remarkable about the, the sort of economic and production side of the war effort is here's an administration that was really at odds with U.S. business leaders, um, you know, on the cusp of World War II to the point where they hated FDR um, and were convinced that this was a near communistic kind of uh, administration well all of a sudden fdr is going to turn around and offer them cost plus um, which, is, <laughs> which is some nice goodies in exchange for massive production and it works it works big time and of course labor unions profit from this as well to the point where there is a major pushback against labor unions in this country uh by the end of the war and after because there's so many soldiers are perceived that all that these coal miners or iron workers or whatever had 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 a wonderful economic time at home while I'm off making $21 a month as a private in a foxhole at Salerno. Um, and, you know, I, and so I don't like that, you know, so interesting tensions that, that were taking place, but somehow it all leads to tremendous production. That, do you think that's answered your initial question, Jim? <laughs> well, yeah, and actually, I'm just I'm just looking at, at at so this one. This is a really interesting one. Cargo vessel turnaround time in days in 1943. Mm. So New York to the Near East, it's 120 days. Damn. I mean, that is amazing, isn't it? And then yeah. a cargo ship. That's a transport. So transport obviously is much faster. Can do kind of you know 20 plus knots cargo ship freighter doing you know 14 if you're lucky nine if you're slow 210 i mean that's amazing so that can only really go once a year 
Oh, so, yeah. yeah, so New York to the United Kingdom, a cargo ship is 60 days. Now, boy, that changed. That's a turnaround time. That's turnaround time. So that yeah. is from loading it up, getting it there, unloading it, getting it back again, start the whole process all over again. So think of how many ships you need if you've got that kind of protracted uh, turnaround time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. planning planning is to from New York to the Mediterranean theater is 45 days, actual 53.5. That's on a transport. Cargo ship, 75 days, actual, planning. So there's a difference, obviously, between planning and, and, and actuality. It's 78.1. Boston to Greenland, yeah. which you'd avoid. The actual t- turnaround time of a cargo ship is 102. That has got to be down to your point about stevedores, hasn't it? Absolutely. It's got to be, because, I mean, <laughs> it doesn't take that long <laughs> to get there and back. Okay, so what do you, what do you reckon the... the, the Time to the South Pacific Theater mm. is from San Francisco. Actual turnaround, turnaround time. time. Ship. Yeah. Okay, we're probably looking at 30 to 45 days, I would think. <laughs> You're so wrong. 133.6. I was going to say 120. You beat, wow. you, you beat me to When it, was Jim. that, James? <laughs> 1943. Wow. Charleston to India. 185 days. Mm. I mean, that's that's incredible, isn't it? And so suddenly you're starting, you know, if you think about 130 days, I mean, that's that's more than a third of a year. Yeah, yeah so di- diverting That's stuff. four months. So yeah. diverting stuff to, say, to Bengal, at the height of the famine, it's just, it's just you, you might might want to, but but that's already been allocated, and that's before you've even, I mean, the, mm. the, the turnaround time is just the turnaround. That's not the actual... Well, I mean, a, a case in point is the Shermans sent to Alamein, aren't they? Is that, that that requires an intervention in the existing shipping planning and uh, manifests and everything that disrupts the pa- – puts a ripple through things for the rest of the year, doesn't it? I mean, it, it, because it has to. It, if yeah. you're suddenly re- allocating tanks that were going to England or whatever to send them to North Africa, I mean, if you, it, it, it must be like an enormous, an enormous uh, arcane puzzle. And if you change one bit, the rest of it changes too. And, and absolutely, and this, and this is why at the Casablanca conference, one of the absolute number one priorities to come out of that is we've got to defeat the U-boats because you need to be able to plan because you need to know that ninety-eight percent of your shipping that you send off from from New York or Halifax or wherever it's going from is going to reach its destination. You yeah, can't have that being interrupted because you can't plan anything. You know how can you, you can. plan? I mean, and a case in point is 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 of course is, is Rommel. Um, in, in the build up to Alam Halfa, you know, he's expecting these these nine vessels to come over and rescue him and provide him with his hundred thousand tons he needs. All of them get sunk. Yeah. When that happens, you're you're done. I mean, it's you're just done. devastating. So if that happens to the Allies, I mean basically it's all about the US projecting its power overseas. Uh if you can't do that because of the U boats, you have then marginalized the United States and you put Great Britain in some level of existential peril. Uh much less how it impacts the Soviet Union too. So the, it all starts with the U-boats because it all starts with shipping. And I think they understood right. that at Casablanca, if not even before. Mm. Now, the thing is, um, uh, we're going to take a break very shortly. Jim wanted to talk about this before we got into what we were going to talk about in this episode. I just want to let the listener know that this this is a momentary... Yeah, but it's been dig- interesting, hasn't it? You know, but this, this is a momentary oh. digression. If you're new to the style of podcasting that James Holland and I have done over the last few years, this is fairly typical. We plan to talk about one thing. <laughs> uh, a, a sort of supplementary question is thrown up, and then we end up talking about it for more than 20 minutes. So we're going to take a brief break, and then we'll be back to what we decided we were going to talk about in the first place. We'll see you in a second. <laughs> Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk USA with me, Al Murray, uh, James Holland, and John McManus. And that whole first half was essentially a digression because what we wanted to talk about, or what we'd agreed we were going to talk about today, <laughs> is Robert Lawrence Eichelberger. Um, the, I mean, to, to the to the English ear, that couldn't sound like a more perfect American general name. If I'm honest with you, he sounds he sounds faintly Prussian. If that's a um, a, a thing worth putting on the table. And he sounds like an American eagle of victory with stars on his epaulets and all that sort of he stuff. He certainly does. To the uninitiated, he's, a, he's, he's been in the army a really long time. 
he was at the start of the Second World War. He's he's, he's in charge of West Point, isn't he? And get, and yeah, he was get, superintendent. At that superintendent, stage. and and gets rid of horse riding and close drill and all that sort of stuff. It says we've uh, sorry, lads, we've got to update things a little. I mean, he's a figure who, when you read his career and you look at his citations, you look at his medals. Why is he not on? Why is he not on people's lips? Um, uh, and before we answer that, John, tell us about Eichelberger. I just love his name. Yeah, I, I know. Say. What a name, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a suspiciously German name, so it's a good yes. thing, I guess, that he didn't fight in the European theater, though we wanted to. Uh, and we should but, say you're a massive fan, aren't you? I, I have to say I am. I, I think, personally, he's probably the best U.S. ground commander who isn't all that well-known. Uh, possibly the best of the war. Uh, among, I mean, the, the U.S. Army had some very good Army commanders. I, I don't know that there was anybody better than Eichelberger, who, who commands 8th Army by the end of the war. Um, Eichelberger was he has a really interesting background. Uh, he's the, he's like many Americans, the product of the Civil War. Um, his father was a Union veteran, very successful huh. lawyer and gentleman farmer in Ohio. His mother was a Southerner who came from Vicksburg of all places and remembered, um, you know, the the crisis of the siege and and uh, seeing wounded treated and and all of this. And so, Eichelberger is the youngest of five siblings and. And I only mention that because I really do think it shapes his personality in that right. the father, like a lot of successful uh, parents, were worried about, well, my kids, they're soft. They've, they've grown up in luxury that I've given them, and I don't think they're going to make their way in the world. And they're not as tough as I am. And I've been through the war and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So so Eichelberger's father would sort of create uh, almost like a reality TV situation in which uh, it was almost blood sport of the siblings against one another. And four of them were boys. Uh, so you can imagine <laughs> Eichelberger's competition <laughs> with his older brothers and he's the baby and it's tough for him to compete with siblings who are older. And, and uh, so he, he's not taken very seriously, but he's developing this very affable, attractive personality. He understands people. He, he's very perceptive and he's fascinated when uh, he's he's sitting among uh, the Civil War veterans who would come to his father's uh, library that he had in the house, they would gather and they'd talk about the war and Eichelberger just ate it up. Uh, and so what ends up happening with Eichelberger is the way that he can prove himself is as a soldier. All his brothers went into the financial side and, and he tried to get rich that way. His uh, sister did sort of the one thing that was available in that sort of gender restricted era, go and marry a rich guy. Um, you know, that that was sort of an emblem of success for her. Eichelberger finds his way at West Point, um, cl graduates the class in 1909, and then finds that he's just a natural soldier, a natural leader. Um, it's it's really interesting how his career unfolds. Um, oh, what, what is it about him that gives him that natural leadership? What, what he, cause, cause now we're kind of honing into kind of what is it that makes a good, a, a, yeah, a good I think it's men. I think he has this incredible sensitivity to understanding what makes people tick. Uh, what, understanding, for instance, early in his career, uh, that if there was a 200-mile road march, that the only way he could get the respect of his soldiers, who were very hard-bitten guys, many of them, hard-drinking, gamble away their winnings on a Friday night kind of guys, which Eichelberger wasn't, was to, to continue driving himself to the point of physical limitations. I mean, it, you know, whether he had blisters on his feet didn't matter. He understood that he had to set an example for his soldiers. He understood what they respected and what they didn't. He had a very keen sense of how other people thought and how they would react to him. And he was glib. He was um, he had a great sense of humor, which he used very effectively um, as, as an officer. And he was you know, he would just walk the walk rather than talk the talk. And it, you see that from when he's a young lieutenant. You see it when he's an intel officer uh, in the uh, the Siberian expedition or during and after World War One. You see it certainly later in combat in World War II. This guy is always showing what leadership means rather than telling you. Um, as so glib got, as he is, he's a doer. He's got really great antenna then for, for how to handle people and... But also for soldiering, because, I mean, you could be good at the former, but the latter doesn't necessarily follow, does it? Yeah, he understands the rudiments of soldiering very, very well. Um, and, you know, in terms of how to, you know, how to shoot and how to, you know, how to physical endurance. He's a, he's a physically robust person, as many of the successful generals are. Uh, so he's fortunate health-wise. Um, 
that he he just understands how to to um, forge good relationships with people, uh, productive relationships. You know, as you're moving up the army hierarchy, it could be very easy to make enemies, and and more than a few really good officers did. Uh, I would be hard pressed to think of any enemies Eichelberger ever made pre World War II. Um, he ends up with one who's really of his own making, his colleague, uh, General Walter Kruger, who commands Sixth Army, whom Eichelberger had came, come to detest by the end of the war. Uh, but that was more of a one way kind of kind of thing. Right. Eichelberger just just had that sense of, of how to make friends with people, but not just that. Uh, it was also productive work wise, too. Yeah. You mentioned Siberia there. Um, many people well, we'll be saying what Siberia nineteen nineteen? What <laughs> earth? Is, what the earth Russians is sure Siberia? remember that. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, of course, yeah. But this is a <laughs> pre- previous iteration of the Russians. So, so wh- why that the, there are um, British, French, and American forces in Siberia, aren't there in nineteen nineteen? So it's 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 fighting it's fighting on the side of the White Russians. Yes. Yeah, against the Bolsheviks. So it's uh, an attempt uh, to, as as Churchill had said it, strangle Bolshevism in its cradle. Yeah. Uh, which, in retrospect, was a very good notion. Um, mm. You know, too bad it didn't work. But in, in this case, you've got Western Allied troops being sent there, but also quite significantly Japanese troops, too, yeah. uh, who are fighting with them as well. And uh, so. Yeah, that's yeah, amazing. So, yeah, so so Eichelberger is class of 1909, so you would think, okay, here it is, seven, eight, nine years later, he wants to be on the Western Front, you know, that's where his career is going to be made, uh, and yet, you know, he's deployed to Siberia, but it's not a career ender. In fact, it's it helps blossom him, because he's able to do really do a lot of different jobs that may not have been available to him, you know, in a typical division on the Western Front. He's an intel officer. He's also kind of an operations officer. He's an aide de camp to General Graves, who's the the, uh, the U.S. Mm-hmm. commander, and uh, he becomes a major mentor for Eichelberger. Eichelberger sees combat, uh, gets the Distinguished Service Cross because of his bravery, and he also, by the way, studies his allies, especially the Japanese, whom he, you know, this didn't make him unique, but he could see that eventually there could be conflict with Japan. So right. he studied them minutely. He was embedded for a while with the Japanese artillery unit. Um, and so, you know, he and it's interesting. He didn't study it from the standpoint of I don't like these guys. I hate Japanese or I think they're a lesser race or something. He's, he he had empathy for them and kind of liked them, but also thought we're going to tangle and I better know what these guys are about. Did, did he learn clear. Japanese while he was doing that? Um, not as much as he wanted to. He tried. Um, and he learned some, which he he felt that 30 years later or whatever it was, 25 years later, he promptly forgot more of it than he would have wanted to. So he Maxwell Taylor, by the way, was different in that he had been sent to Japan as a language officer, had immersed himself and had become fairly conversant in Japanese. Eichelberger wasn't to that level. Right. Gosh. So where where is he at the beginning of World War, World War II then? Yeah, so World War II comes along. On Pearl Harbor Day, he was um, listening to a football game uh, in his office, uh, uh, the superintendent of the U.S. Military Academy. Um, And he hears what had happened, and he immediately, of course, wants a command. He wants out of the superintendency. Uh, One little aside with that, too, with, with getting the superintendency at West Point. I mean, that was a career capstone for some people. Um, And it was a point of pride for him. And someone once overheard him. I don't know how this happened, but he was uh, somehow referring to his father when he was at West Point and uh, like having a sort of retrospective conversation with his dead father. And uh, he said, you didn't think I could even make it here. And now I'm running the place, you know, and I really (laughs) think that that was an insight into Eichelberger and what sort of drove him. Um, So he gets command of the 77th Infantry Division immediately after Pearl Harbor uh, and does such a remarkable job with them uh, that he is sort of earmarked for Corps command, and he is the guy who is available when when uh, General MacArthur is going to launch his Buna campaign in 1942. Um, the way that all came about was also a little bit of a break for Eichelberger in that a different officer, Lieutenant General Robert Richardson, who had seniority over Eichelberger, was initially tapped by uh, Marshall and MacArthur to command what becomes known as I Corps. And and uh, Richardson was a little leery of of how much control the Australians might have uh, of, uh, you know, U.S. command and all this kind of stuff. And, and he, he voices some concerns to, to Marshall and Marshall is like, I have no patience for this. 
hell with him. We'll put him aside. And I'm putting Eichelberger, I'm sending Eichelberger there. Um, it wasn't necessarily fair to Richardson on some levels, but uh, Richardson ends up in a very anonymous but really important post of um, uh, the, the the highest army commander under Admiral Nimitz in the right. you know the rest of the Pacific. Uh, so you, so by that sort of fortuitous sense, Eichelberger gets the command. But I should also say Eichelberger had worked for MacArthur when uh, MacArthur was chief of staff in the 1930s. And so he knew Eichelberger very well and was like many, everybody else really comfortable with him and respected him. Um, and then he, you know, he famously leans on him when the whole Buna thing is starting to go sideways. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, you know, Bob, get in there and, and bail this situation out. Uh, and so you'll see a little bit of that pattern with these two that Eichelberger becomes kind of the fireman in the Pacific. So, so, you know, there's obviously you know different theaters require different styles of leadership and different styles of command. But I always kind of think the best generals are ones who understand the strategic picture, the strategic aims that they're trying to do, that they're trying to achieve, that their superiors want them to achieve. That they understand that operational level of of how logistics work and how supplies work and what and what they're, they're what can be done with the forces that they've got. And they also understand the tactical about how and, and are innovative and want to kind of move forward and are constantly looking to kind of see how, how things can be better. Does he fit into that, that group? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And the classic example is when he gets to Buna. So, you know, the backdrop to the situation is of course that Buna's is on the North coast of Papua New Guinea. Um, you know, MacArthur and the Australians want to capture those Japanese bases there. This is all happening while Guadalcanal is going on. There's a lot of concern the Japanese will win at Guadalcanal and then come back, reinforce right. Buna, and then threaten Port Moresby, so on and so forth. And so uh, the, the uh, U.S. Army's 32nd Infantry Division has been sent uh, to, to go to the, the northern part of, of New Guinea there and yep. take Buna. And this is November and early December 1942. But it's just not happening. Um, it is a complete mess. You're fighting in swamps. You're dealing with coconut log reinforced bunkers on every route of advance. Um, the supply situation is really the key problem. And right. so MacArthur famously sends Eichelberger there, you know, and tells him, take Boona Bob or don't come back alive, which is just, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. just amazing. And uh, so he gets there and really, you know, it's, it speaks to what you were talking about, James, that um, he really kind of sees the, the the logistical side first. Now he has a reputation of being a lead from the front guy, and and he does. But when he gets to Buna, he sees that soldiers are basically living in squalor. You're lucky to get maybe one C ration a day. Um, right. You've you've got disease issues. You you don't have proper foot gear. All this kind of stuff. And yet he discovers that at Dobadura, which is I don't know ten miles from the perimeter or something, you've right. got all these all this stuff just sort of sitting there and it's not getting to where it needs to be. And that's the thing that really causes him more anger than anything. And, right. and he gets that situation squared away, which then in turn creates a new kind of command that is going to be more eager to fight. And, uh, but he's going to have to lead from the front constantly. So there's the logistical side, the tactical side, certainly where he's leading small unit actions, basically as a squad leader, practically every day in December. And then wow. the strategic side, understanding, you know, the importance of taking Buna and breaking the back of Japanese resistance. So you see really all three working together there, and that'll be a pattern for him through the whole war. Because actually, you know, there's, there's, there's only a handful who kind of make it all the way through, you know, senior commanders, because people, you know, whether it's Friedendorf or whoever it might be, you know, the, people come and go, you know, they fall by the wayside, they're not quite up to it, they get sacked, you know, they prove that it shows that they're, they're, they're wanting. And so much is developing in the Second World War. Tactics, equipment, how you do things, capabilities, they're all advancing and changing so rapidly that as a senior commander, you've just got to keep on top of all that stuff, haven't you? And you've got to be an innovator yourself. Yeah, yeah, and he finds that. I mean, this is a kind of an infantryman's fight, uh, atypical in the sense that, you know, later on, you're going to have more artillery support, you're going to have some seaborne support and air support and all that. Buna is an infantryman's fight. Uh, it's small groups, six to a dozen guys fighting in swamps and bunkers here. And there. You know, it's really a morass. Um, and in terms of the 
the ruthlessness uh, from a command standpoint, like you, like you said, Jim, I mean, like the Frieden dolls or whatever cast by the wayside or whatever. Well, here's Eichelberger, and we know how he's friends with like everybody. Uh, and he comes to Buna and it's his classmate and friend, Forrest Harding, in command of the 32nd Division. Right. Now, when Eichelberger gets there, he wants to preserve Harding's job, even though MacArthur has told him, go in and relieve Harding. Uh, but but Eichelberger says to Harding, hey, look, <laughs> you know, we've been buddies a long time. I know what you're up against here, uh, you know, X, Y, and Z. What, he, what changes his mind is that he realizes Harding has never really been to the front and that he won't go to the front and doesn't want Eichelberger there and the logistical problems that right. he just feels are inexcusable. So he cans Harding. Imagine what that's like for him. This yeah. guy who gets along with everybody to can his old friend. And then this is so MacArthur. When Harding goes back to to swap a headquarters and talks to MacArthur, like, I don't understand why this has happened, why I was fired, what you know, and MacArthur's like, Well, I don't know. I I didn't really have anything to do with it, even though <laughs> he was the guy who told him to, to fire him. Oh, <laughs> and God. so it's it's so typical MacArthur, but yeah. it also had a terrible legacy for the class of nineteen oh nine because Harding then forever blamed Eichelberger for his relief had a grind uh, had an axe to grind against him and so there would be this divide in the class whenever they would get together in later years oh. you know which really was a shame because it wasn't Eichelberger's fault and Eichelberger tried to reach out to him and all this kind of stuff and it, it kind uh, and of just went nowhere and that's part of why Eichelberger's perhaps been sort of elbowed to the back of the historical record um we don't know about him as, as well as we might yeah yeah, because, I mean, he, he serves under the ultimate publicity hound, not yeah. just in World War II, but maybe in military history, Douglas yeah. MacArthur, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. who is just, you know, I mean, he just sucks the oxygen out of every room. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and also, he kind of holds Eichelberger back. So this is also MacArthur, you know, after Buna and the success of Buna, uh, you know, Eichelberger's elated and whatnot. And, and um, MacArthur is like, yeah, I mean, OK, talk to the reporters and and uh, this is Eichelberger loves talking to reporters he's he yeah. has good relationship with him he's charming and all this and so he does that and then MacArthur realizes oh someone else is getting publicity i don't want yeah. this and so yeah. then he threatens Eichelberger threatens to send him home as a colonel and all this and so <laughs> Eichelberger you know then is very gun shy about getting any publicity and then behind the scenes make sure that he doesn't co get command of first army which, uh, you know, Eichelberger knew Eisenhower pretty well, and yeah. Eisenhower possibly would have wanted him to command First Army. He doesn't get that, whereas MacArthur sort of tells him in person, tells Eichelberger in person, I'm not going to hold you back. And then behind the scenes, what's he doing? Holding him back. <laughs> well, also, Eichelberger gets recommended for a Medal of Honor, doesn't he? And, and, and MacArthur's having none of that. Yeah, so MacArthur scotches that behind the scenes, too. Um, and then, not even that, he... he Eichelberger gets another Distinguished Service Cross, but the way the citations are written is very similar to others who hadn't really seen much combat. And this really rankled Eichelberger. So this is, you know, Eichelberger has many great qualities. What wasn't his greatest quality was that the resentments he would nurse, um, you know, right. that, that really metastasized later in his life, like post-retirement, when he got thinking about how much he resented what MacArthur did and and Kruger and all this kind of stuff. And and so he just sort of splays all this out in dictations later, which is great <laughs> for his story. And, and he, had, he had confided a lot of this during and after the war in incredible letters to his wife, Emma. Uh, he and his wife were incredible soulmates. They had no kids. They just had each other. And uh, those letters that he wrote are beyond fascinating. Um, and you can read them all, can you? Yeah. I mean, they're all at, uh, at Duke University yep. um, in voluminous papers. That and the dictations that he had later on, the photographs. Wow. There's a book um, called Dear Miss M that right. uh, Jay Luvas had published. But this has been 50 years ago now. And it's just it's edited letters. So if you really want, I mean, that's great. But if you want the actual originals, which are better, there there's that at uh, Duke, and also he has papers at uh, at Carlisle too at AHEC. Um, right. It's not as extensive a collection, but it's still pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. So the hard part when you're looking at all this is parsing together if if it's what's different in what archive versus what, uh, and whether it overlaps. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So he's he's right. a dream from an historian standpoint. 
because he, he <laughs> documented so much of this and his true feelings are out there. Um, um, what, uh, yeah. John, what, what do you think is his, is his sort of standout phase of command? Because, I mean, he does some extraordinary things. Right at the end of the war, he's, he's sort of doing this rolling amphibious thing in, in the Philippines where Eighth Army are clearing the Philippines out, you know, the last bits and pieces that need doing. I mean, it's what is it? It's 14 major and 24 minor amphibious operations all in six weeks. I mean, that's, that's breath, Incredible. Breath, breathtaking. And that speaks to someone who can obviously deal with the Navy, coordinate with, with, his, with his air support, um, motivate his men to do this very, very difficult and order his men to do this very, very difficult thing over and over and over and over and over again. Is that his, you know, because if you just pick that out of a hat, that just, that sounds like there aren't any people in the Western theatre doing anything, anything like as ambitious as that, are there? No, it's Not absolutely amazing. And he, he, he renames his army the Amphibious Aeth, you know, because they have all these amphibious invasions that go on over the spring of 1945. When you study that campaign, it's a master of like overall coordination, uh, inner service coordination, logistical coordination and planning with tactical um, inspiration where he, he kind of picks his spots where he, he, he comes in and out, whether it's at Cebu one day or at Mindanao another right. day or Palawan or something. Uh, he's dancing around these various spots, getting influence where he can, leading soldiers when he can, because that's how he does things. But he's also like the larger brain in charge of this whole thing. And, and the speed at which it happens is really kind of breathtaking. Um, the sad thing about it is it's questionable strategically whether this needs to be fought at all. So it's completely anonymous. It's as if you had a brilliant campaigner who figured out how to clear the Brittany Peninsula. Um, or, you know, or the, <laughs> the, the leftover ports that were way behind as the, the war had moved on into Germany or something, you know, um, you know, the Philippines campaign arguably had started to kind of peter out already by the spring of 1945, even though sixth army was still enmeshed in Luzon in the jungles, but, uh, the war was moving northward toward Japan, obviously. So, so it's really kind of a shame from Michael Berger's standpoint that that's, that campaign is overlooked, but you also see even before that, this dash from Manila in, uh, in January 1945, which is one of the most fascinating stories that I've ever looked into as, an, as a World War II historian, you basically have the crux of, of Sixth Army coming from the north into Manila, the 1st Cavalry Division and the 37th Infantry Division in like Manila's northern suburbs, and it's going to be hellacious urban combat that they get involved in. Um, but then... MacArthur unleashes Eichelberger from the south, mainly yeah. just through the 11th Airborne Division, uh, which is like perfect for Eichelberger control because it's controlled by Joe Swing, who's very like him. And so here's a here's an airborne unit of about 8000 guys yeah. coming up from the south and completely outfighting, outthinking, outmaneuvering the Japanese until finally, bam, they run up against these very potent defenses called the Ganko Line and the southern approaches to Manila, and they get enmeshed in the urban combat too. But it, it's it's actually, in some ways, Eichelberger's shining moment on a lot of levels, uh, how quickly this happens. And it's one of the things that leads MacArthur to give him that job to clear out the rest of the archipelago, you know, several months later in the spring. Sure. So where is he at the very end of the war then? Yeah, so at the end of the war, he's he taken over. He doesn't get army commander. He's, yeah, he's the 8th Army commander. He had gotten 8th Army command by the uh, like the fall of forty four. Um, so he's had a hand in the Leyte battle and, uh, and as I mentioned, you know, the Manila thing, the, uh, cleaning out the, the rest of the Philippines through, uh, you know, by the summer 1945, and then he's mm -hmm. getting control of the rest of the Luzon campaign that from yep. Eichelberger's point of view, he would have felt Kruger had mismanaged. I don't know whether that, I'm not saying I agree with that, but, but Kruger also that thinks that the Krug Kruger has his issues with Eichelberger, doesn't he? Yeah, he does, because he thinks Eichelberger is too indulgent with his staff. He thinks he's too aggressive. They they just have a little bit of a different philosophy, and that Kruger is more deliberate. Right. A lot of times the word you hear associated with him is cautious, and I think there's some truth to that. I think Kruger was a fine commander, but he's just, he's not cut from the same aggressive cloth as right. Eichelberger. And I, so I think he feels Eichelberger is too glib, um, that, he, that he is too publicity conscious, and, you know, that could well be. 
Uh, Eichelberger feels Kruger is too slow and, and exacting and rude. What right. he can't stand about him is how rude he is just oh, at, really? a, at a personal <laughs> level. Uh, yeah. He's just like, how can this guy be this rude? It's like a lot of the way, sometimes the way people reacted to Montgomery, you're like, really? Yeah. Did you just say that? You know, th- yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. Um, you know, so at the end of the war, Eichelberger is um, dealing with the Luzon campaign because sixth army is going to get the initial invasion into Japan into Kyushu called Operation right. Olympic. But really, that's a staging campaign. And Eichelberger was going to get the lead role in what was called Cornet, um, you know, to hit uh, Honshu and to, to go for Tokyo in March 1946. So he's involved, of course, with the, the initial occupation, the, the USS Missouri surrender and all that. But then for about three years, he heads up uh, the Eighth Army during the occupation of Japan. So wow. he's MacArthur's key guy in, in terms of ground troops occupation uh you know in in uh the occupation of japan so that i think that's right. kind of overlooked too and that that was huh. crucial to the to the end of his career um after the war you said he carries grudges and bears has stored some up after the war does he write a memoir in which he um sticks it to all the people who've um <laughs> uh, well uh, uh, pissed him off like the man himself um the the memoir is cordial and polite it's beautifully written. It's fascinating. It's uh, it's called Our Jungle Road to, to Tokyo. I, I highly recommend it because it's, it's, it's just enjoyable. And it's written by reading. him, is it? Isn't it? Good it's written by him. Oh, uh, yet he had it. a he had a writer named Milton McKay who worked with him. And I really don't know why he did this because Michael Berger was a good writer. Um, right. He was a good communicator. He really didn't need McKay, and McKay drove him nuts because McKay was <laughs> was kind of a drunk. And, oh no. And, he was a drinker and he was kind of lazy and, and didn't and, and didn't keep regular hours. And that drove Eichelberger nuts. Um, but, you know, so you'll see him as the sort of second name on the memoir. But really, Eichelberger wrote most of it. And it's so, good. Oh, it's tremendous. And, and he did uh, it, some of it was serialized in the Saturday Evening Post. Um, you know, so there was all that. And he made good money off that. So he, he retires in 1948. Um, and then he, he's. He's pretty well off because his wife, Emma, had um, inherited a pretty good amount of money. She came from a kind of upper middle class background from Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, so she had some money and Eichelberger had a nice pension and he had gotten good money off his writings. And so he lived a pretty comfortable retirement life and he could then sit down and think about everything that had happened and, and write about it and dictate about it and, and stew about it. Um, but so our jungle road to Tokyo, you won't find a lot of fork tongue kind of stuff in there where you'll really find the the sort of fork tongue stuff is in his dictations that he has like in the 1950s and um you know much later and especially in reaction to how macarthur manages korea too uh that appalled eichelberger and 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 the sort of hero worship of him and all that he he found himself kind of sickened by it to be honest with you oh that's interesting (laughs) so he he would have he would have been quite comfortable with truman sacking uh, oh yeah yeah and he thought he should have done it sooner um because right. because he thought that macarthur probably would have de- deserved sacking for mismanaging the campaign in the fall of 1950 and and uh so he, he so when eichelberger saw the big parades that uh, macarthur got when he came home in april may 1951 he was just sickened by it all he's like oh my god you're lo- you, when i look at his private correspondence he's writing to people like oh my god can you even believe this you know um, wow. And yet he he never came out publicly and denounced MacArthur, though sometimes he would have jibing criticisms here and there. Uh, but he never came out and denounced him. He threatened to uh, privately later in the 1950s, write like a tell all. And fortunately, Clovis Byers, who was Eichelberger's chief of staff and like a brother to him and, and was still a lieutenant general in the army, he kind of gently dissuaded Eichelberger from doing that. And I think that's for the best because it. It wouldn't have made Eichelberger look good. Um, no, 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 and it wouldn't have done any good. Hmm. God, wow, what an interesting fellow! Yes, thank you, John. Um, yeah, he's fascinating. He really is. You've put him on the map there for people who um, otherwise might not. Yeah, might not I'm very tempted to look into that book. It looks like it might be out of print. Um, so maybe yeah. that's one for us to get into print. Now. Yeah, it is. It's a really interesting book, and I, so I've tried to bring him to life in the you know my army in the Pacific trilogy. And, yeah, no, he uh, what he know, absolutely get, does. Yeah, get a good sense of that. There's two really good biographies of him too. Um, one of which is is probably too laudatory, maybe a little bit. Uh, John Shortall's biography, and then there's another one by a guy named Kwiatkowski, 
um, called In Caesar's Shadow, which I think is a great title. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we all know what he right. meant. But yeah, it, it's yeah, yeah, it's really well researched and a, and a terrific book, too. So. Yeah, that's yeah. brilliant. Very good. Yeah, the other thing, the last point, Eichelberger was a classmate of Patton's. And uh, one of the right. things I found is they kept in touch during the war very closely. And they, they really had a very, very similar kind of operational philosophy. Um, and Patton wrote this letter. Um, this is in 1945. He writes this letter to, to Eichelberger saying, you know, you're the master of amphibious warfare. I hope to come and learn at your knee, you know, at some point. And, and uh, you know, it was interesting to see Patton write that because Patton knew quite a bit about amphibious warfare, too. But that, that showed some level of respect that he had. So they, they kept in touch and they, they had very, very similar outlooks. But their character was totally, totally different on, on a lot of levels. Yeah, well, everyone's a bit different to George Patton. I think that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, as we've explored in a different episode, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah, oh, brilliant. Well, thank you, John. Well, thank you so stuff. much. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah, and, great um, stuff. Thanks. I'm going to take a 120 day trip to the Cape now. In, uh, in, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll hold yeah, you to I'm that in your turnaround. <laughs> uh, maybe 210 somewhere else. Maybe right 210 now. to somewhere else <laughs> unexpected. Yeah, it's, it's taking the experiential uh, um, level to a new, a new degree. Yeah. That is the ultimate immersion. Very good. <laughs> well, very thanks good. everybody for listening. We will see you again very soon. Cheerio.